Good morning, everyone. Thanks for, hope you all had a very restful, nice, calm spring break. Some people. Uh, yeah, so, so now we get right back to it. So as you can see on the screen, uh, project four is out. Um, I don't have the links up on the website, but it is up on the website if you go to project dash four. Um, after, right after class, I'll post all that. But So the idea here for project four is going to be due April 1st. It's not an April Fool's joke. Are you sure? <laughs> make it April I am sure. We should just make it April 2nd just so we don't have it. Well, we could go back to March, was it 30th, 31st, whatever it is. So that way there won't be any confusion. No. Okay, so the idea is for project four, there's basically two parts of project four. The first part, you have to finish an incomplete parser. So we're going to give you some code, some parsing code for a language, and the grammar of this language we're going to see right here. Um, some parts of this language are not actually specified, so you have to complete the parser and write those parts. Um, I highly, highly recommend you do this part first. Right? So if you do the rest of it, type checking, whatever, but you don't, didn't finish the parser or do the parsing correctly, uh, then it's really no point. Uh, okay, and then, why this project is really cool, you're going to be given an input language, and you're going to do type checking on that language. So the input is going to be a program, and the output's either going to be like a compiler. So what does your compiler spit out if there's type errors? What the type error is. Yeah, what the error is, a little bit of information, right? So, But this is all you're doing. You're not executing the program. You're just checking for type errors. So you're going to output if there's an error. You're going to output the error message. Um, and if it's correct, if it's a correctly typed program, then you're going to output all of the equivalent types in the program so we know that you know it was done correctly. And so this document basically, the project description de describes the input grammar, the language, and all of the type rules that you're going to need to successfully do this project. Any questions at a high level before we get kind of more into it? I could change that. No, I think so. Okay. So. Is that online? Uh, it will be right after class. I think it technically is online, but there's no links to it. So. Okay. So this is the grammar description. Ever anybody? Well. Okay. I'll rephrase that to not uh, out yourself. Uh, you should know how to read this grammar description, right? <laughs> Been talking about context-free grammars all class, <laughs> right? So self-check. Do I understand how to read this grammar description? The basic idea is your program is going to be first a set of declarations and then the body of the program. Um, and this defines how types you can define in the declarations. You can define types, and then you can define variables that are of that type. Um, and we'll see examples of this. So I obviously, you'll need to go through you know, this and understand exactly what's happening here. Um, so I won't go into it in a lot of detail, but I want to hit the high notes right now. Um, you can see it's kind of long, right? <laughs> okay, uh, these are the tokens, so just so that that's very clear. So you won't need to worry about tokenizing, so the parser that we're going to give you already handles all the tokenization. Um, so you won't have to deal with that. Uh, so. All right, we're going to get to an example. Ah, okay, perfect. All right, so this is an example of a program written in our language. So we have first, so this whole top declaration before the braces, this is, um, this is the declaration section. And then inside in here, we're defining the type section. So this defines, okay, so the way to read this, on the left is a name, and on the right is the definition of that type. So here we're saying that type A is an integer type. And here we're saying type B is an A type. So what type is type B? Int. Int. Yay. <coughs> Success. See, you're already going to do awesome with this. OK. Then in the variable section, here we de de declare the variables that we're going to be used. 
Uh, so here on the left is a list of variable names, and on the right of the colon is the type of that variable name. Uh, so if this is variable name b, then what does that mean the type of x is? Int. Int, yes. OK, we also have a variable y. But why is the type c? Undefined. undefined. It is undefined. But based on this, so this is the body of the program. This is y is assigned to x. So given this, x is assigned to y. No, no, y is assigned to x, right? Y gets the value of x. Yeah, yeah. But from this uh, assignment statement, what do we know here for this program to type check? What do we know about the types here of x and y? <coughs> They have to be the same, exactly. So can you tell what should be the type of C? It should be an int. Int. It has to be an int in order for this uh, program to compile. So this is actually one of the really cool things about this language as opposed to other languages. Uh, we can have implicit types and implicit variables. So here we can de define a variable with some type that we actually have never declared. Right? And then based on the usage in the program, we can infer, hey, is, this what, is there a possible way for this to type check? And if so, what is the type? What is actually the type of C? Right? And so here we can see that it's int. Yeah. But that must be taken care of in the global part, not the body. Uh, what taken care of? All the type types. So this is where we get into. These are implicit. Uh, sorry. Oh, uh, these are explicit types, so here we're explicitly defining type A is an integer, and type B is a type A. This is an implicit type because it doesn't have a definition of, it's not explicitly defined in the type section. So as the program goes through itself, it starts to define itself? Yes. Well, the types of the program are defined based on the usage. And that's, this is really the key of what you're doing here is how do you do this type inference? Um, and we'll see exactly how to do that later in the class. Um, but this is your goal. This is where you're trying to get to. Uh, so we can go up. We can see that uh, So we have five built-in types, ints, reals, booleans, strings, and longs. Um, types are either explicit or implicitly declared. So we saw explicit types uh, are type names. Maybe so. We have, to, you know, we have to go through all the semantics here, right? So this is defining all the semantics of exactly what we mean here. Um, so explicit types and implicit types. So that's exactly what this means. So this type C here is never declared as a type, right? And so its actual type is, depends on the usage. OK. The same thing with variables, right? This is another cool thing. So uh, any programmed in Python or this one is well, Ruby. Uh, I don't think JavaScript does. No, you have to you have to declare things with var, otherwise it's considered global. I guess it kind of has it, but anyways. So variables can be either declared explicitly. So what does it mean to be declared explicitly in general? You define it. Yeah, you define it, right? There's a declaration that says, okay, I'm going to use some variable foo, right? Implicit just means that. When the program sees the usage of some variable foo that hasn't been de declared, then it creates a new variable for that, right? It assumes that that is a new declaration of a new <coughs> variable. And so that's what this says. So you know, explicit variables are declared specifically here. Uh, otherwise, it's implicit if it's not declared explicitly, but it appears in the program body. So for instance, in this program, right, very similar, Type section, what's the type of type A? Int. And the type of type B? Int. Int as well. And so the type of X is? Int. Int, and Y is? Well, when we get to here, we don't know yet, right? When we see this, we see that Y is some type C. And we don't know what type C is in our built-in types. So then we see Y is equal to X. So then how, what does this say about the types of Y and the type of X? They have to be the same for this to type check, right? Uh, 
So this is how we're able to essentially infer that, okay, C must be an int for this to type check. Right? If C was anything other than an int, this won't type check. Yeah. What if we miss that? What do you mean miss that? What if that's missing from the program? Does it throw an error? No. So it doesn't know what C is. All you're doing is type checking. Yeah, exactly. So you know, type C could be uh, never declared as a concrete type, and that's fine. Never defined, it's fine. Exactly. Yeah, because we're only checking the type rules. Yeah. So the program would still work if you like under type you switch A in and B A, right? Like if you switch them, so B A was first. Yes. So if you switch them, you would be declaring so if you switch them, A would be an implicit type, right? Because it hasn't been defined yet, but it's been used. And then in the next line, you'd be declaring that A is type integer. And then B would also know that it's <coughs> Exactly, yes. yes. Yeah. So under the hood, once when this is all running, when it figures out what kind of type C is, mm -hmm. does it then like mark that and says, now type C is always, will always be Yes. So for your program to correctly type check, every so we saw y equals x implies a constraint on the types, right? It says the type of x must be the same as the type of y. And the only way to satisfy that constraint is if type of c is an int, right? And that has to hold and be true throughout the entire program. Okay. So if at any other point you see type c is a real, it blows up. That blows up and that's a type error. So you have to declare you have to say that that's a type error. Okay. Yeah, so this is an incredibly simplified version of type, of <coughs> this kind of inference type checking. It's uh, Hindley Milner, which we'll see later, but um, yeah, it's it's a lot more reduced, so it's a lot easier to do. The colon means what? Uh, the colon is our way of declaring. So it means the thing on the left is the variable name, and the thing on the right is the type of that variable name. Okay, so we see y is equal to x, and then we see z is equal to 10. So is Z declared? Is it a declared variable? Nope. No. So do we blow up and nope. say that there's an undefined variable usage? No. Variables can be implicitly defined. Yeah, variables can be implicitly defined, right? So, so then what about this assignment? What do we know then about the types, the type of Z? So when we first see Z, do we have a type for Z? No. No. No, it's some new implicit type that we haven't seen yet. But what do we know about this relation here based on this assignment statement? Yeah, so 10 is an int, right? So the type of z must be an int, right? So this assignment statement to hold. So we don't know what z is, but essentially from the usage here, we infer that z has to be an int. So what about this line? What do we see here? We're assuming w is an int. Our w, is w declared? Nope. Nope. So we're going to create a new implicit variable w with an implicit type. So here in z times 5, does this imply any constraints about the types here? Yeah, well, kind of the answer is it depends, right? Because in some crazy languages, you can multiply integers by strings. Like Python is one of my least favorite parts. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. but. Um, <coughs> But for our language, we'll see for every single operator in a, a, uh, assignments, operators, we have type constraints associated with that. So the types of our language is, hey, any type times any other type can work, but they both have to be the same, and they return that same type. So here, z, this statement means that the type of z must be the same as the type of 5. So what's the type of 5? Int. And what's the type of z? Int because we established that on the other line. So is that consistent? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So are ints and longs ever going to mix? No. no. There's no type conversions in our language, which also makes it a lot easier. So you don't have to worry about all that. Um, so yeah, that's why all the types, ints, longs, reals, they're just end strings. You can consider them distinct types. It doesn't matter at all what they actually are. <coughs> OK, then we have. The type of w is equal to the return of z times 5. So then what's the type of w? Int. Int. Yeah, it's got to be an int, right, for this to type check. Because an int times an int returns an int. And so we're assigning that to w, so that means that must be an int. Great. See, look at this. Like, 
Ninety percent of the way there. <coughs> Something must be missing. More like ten. <laughs> um, okay. Well, you gotta get the hopes up. <laughs> well, that's good. This is. I mean, this is. You need to be able to look at this program and understand exactly what the types are in the program. So this is definitely, definitely useful and important. But you really have to dig in so that you can read these programs, write new programs, write your own test cases in this language, and be able to understand how all the rules apply here. Um, good. So yeah, so this is uh, more kind of semantics that we'll, you'll get into. Um, so talk about the difference between declarations and uses, right? So here A is declared, here B is declared and A is used, right? Because A, we're saying B, we're declaring a new type B that has the type A, right? So this is the use of A. Here we're declaring X and we're using B. Here we're declaring Y and using C. And you can go through this exact thing. We'll step you through all of this. So the type system is where we get to the interesting part. So we uh, really don't care what the operators necessarily are. Um, all we care about is the types for this, right? Because we're only considering checking the types. So these, there are five type rules, and they should follow pretty um, easily from our intuition we just built up looking at the examples, right? So C1, this first type rule says that the left-hand side of the assignment must have the same type as the right-hand side of the assignment, right? which makes sense. You can't assign between different types. Uh, this rule says that operands, we have four operands in this language, plus, minus, multiply, and divide, uh, must have the same type. And it can be any type, right, including string and Boolean. We can add Booleans, minus Booleans, times Booleans, right? Uh, for our purposes, we don't care. All we care is that, that we can do this for the types. Okay, the operands of a relational operator, uh, the relop in the grammar, uh, must be the same type. So we'll see that. So any type. Uh, condition needs to be of type Boolean. Uh, the variable, so in the switch statement, um, so in switch in C, right, you're switching on a variable, and then you go to one of the cases depending on the value of that variable. So here, this says that that type of that variable must be an int. Right, if we're going to switch on something, it's got to be an int. So these are all the type rules, and then these are uh, essentially clarifications. So <coughs> saying that uh, an expression returns the same type as both of its operands. Right? Yeah. Chuck? Um, it says real number constants are of type real. Yes. What's real? It is uh, this one here. Yeah. What's a, what's real? It's a deep question. <laughs> real is real. Oh, wait, oh, no. Real is real. Yeah, it's just one of the five types. So th what this is saying is that there's, in our grammar, right, there are real nums, where real num is a number followed by a dot followed by digits, right? So this is, essentially you can think of this real num here Double. is a token that defines a literal real number. And we're saying that, this is just clarifying that, hey, when you see like a num, the token num has type int. And the token real num has type real. That's what those uh, lines just clarify. What is real? Uh, so this clarifies that whenever you have an expression, right, the result of the expression is the same type of the operators. So if you have int plus int, that returns an int. String times a string is a string. Um, so P1, relational operator. So relational operator is less than, greater than, equal to, not equal to. Uh, the result of that is of type Boolean, right? Uh, uh, yeah, so this says that the number constants, so number tokens have type int, and real num tokens are type real. Oh, yeah, this just clarifies that, like, hey, if we can't, if this ever breaks, then we know that the types have to be different, which means we have a type error. Okay. So your parser is missing these statements. While statements, conditions, do statements, switch statements, case statements, and case. So for 
Regular, yeah. What's the type of A and what's the type of? Oh, A is like an implicit mm. type. Exactly. So that means, so these rules mean that uh, this rule, C2 says that, or no, no, C3 says if we have uh, anything, uh, something, relationship operator, something else, right? So A less than 5, right. right? C3 says A and 5 must have the same type. So if the type of A is implicit. Now we know that the type of A must be an int. Okay. Right? Yeah. What happens if you're either an expression or, or a relational operator? What happens if you don't know either of the types? Ah, if you don't know either type, let's say they're both implicit. So you have A less than B. But what do you know about, so before you get to there, right? Let's say you have two implicit types, two implicit variables, A and B. Right? What's the type of A? It's unknown. It's unknown, but is it the same necessarily as the type of B or type of C or? We're well, assuming I, it I is. imagine we would assume that it would be the same type. Well, same just a second. Before we get there, right? So, uh, okay, let's see. Uh, <coughs> all right. Let's look at this. So let's assume we have. So we actually don't have to have any type declarations, so this could be a valid program in our language. So we can. Well, okay. How am I going to do this? Uh, a is equal to. D plus C times D, right? Okay, so I'm going to parse this expression. So one thing you should do to check yourself is what is the parse tree of this going to look like? So it's going to look something like this. So when we're parsing this, right, we're going to parse down here, and we're going to check this semantically. We're going to say, okay, for this multiply operator, right, so here I have a new variable. What's the type of this variable? Right, so if I'm, I'm cute, so one thing, right, so let's say I have some variable list of variables I've seen so far, mm -hmm. right? So I hadn't seen any variables. There's no declaration of variables, so this list is empty. So I see C, I look C up in my variable list, I say, okay, there's nothing there, so this must be an implicit variable, right? So I create a new variable C in here, and what do I give as the type of this variable C? A placeholder. Yeah, exactly, a placeholder, but do I just use, like, I don't know, placeholder <laughs> alpha, and then when I see D, I'll give it also alpha? D? Well, as, as long as it's let's look at one example that's again. Point, right. we, don't, we don't know if they're if they're the same. Exactly. Yes, that's a key point. Okay, so if I see this, like a is equal to b, and then I see c is equal to d, right? So my variable list here is going to say, okay, the type of a is something, right? So if I just said they're the same, right? There's just some unknown quantity, but I use the same symbol. What does this say about the types of A, B, C, and D? They're all the same. They're all the same. Are the types all the same based on here? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Exactly. We don't know that they're actually the same. So what we do is we want to create a new type here called, let's say, the type of C. Right? So we have to create some brand new type because we don't know what it is. It could be one of the types we know. It could be something else. But for now, all we know is that it's some type C. Then we do that with type D. And then we do type D. Then we say the type of D. Great. Okay, so this, so here the type here is type C, here the type here is type D. So on this uh, multiply operator, what does this mean about the types of C and D? They must be the same. They've got to be the same. Yeah, exactly. With our rules. So we change type D to type C. In our program. Exactly. So we need to, you kind of, this is where you have to, this gets into kind of the nuts and bolts of how you do this, right? But you have to essentially go through, replace every variable that has type D with type C. 
right? So that you know those are the same types. And we will not have a problem. We will not have where they're not the same type. Mm. If you do, then you have a type error. We'll see examples of that in a second. So what's the type of this multiply operator? Type C. Type C. And then here we get to a plus. So we are here. We say, OK, what's the type of this B? Type C. Right, type B, we don't actually know what it is yet, so we have to create a new variable in our type list, type of B. And then we see, okay, what's the, what does our type system say about these types? Type C. They have to be the same. So what am I going to change in my variable list? A little B to C. Yeah, so I'm going to change every type B to type C now. Right, and so what does this plus return? Type C. Type C. And this equal operator, I go to this side and say, what's this type? I look up A in here. I say A, and it has type A when we first see it. And I say, are these two equal? Nope. Or what constraint? They must be equal for it to be. They equal. must be equal, right? This is what my, my type system type says, exactly. So type A must be equal to type C. So I replace every instance of type A in here with type C. And so after this line executes, I know that I don't know exactly what their type is. But I know that based on this statement, they all have to be the same type. <coughs> so if later on at any other point we find out that B is an int and C is a real, then we know that there's a type error. Right? So if this was the program, uh, let's say uh, C is equal to 10, right? So what would this mean about all the types here? That means that they're all ints. Yeah, exactly. So this means that. These types have to be the same. The type of 10 is an int. The type of C is type C. This means that type C has to be int. And then if we go here and we say now D is a 10.10, .10, right? So what's the type of this? Real. A real. real. So we have real is equal to int. That's a problem. Int, right? That's a problem. We can't assign a real to an int, so we have a type error. Yeah, we have to handle type errors. Oh yeah. That's the fun part. Okay. Uh, okay, so back to the parsing. So you only have to implement for regular credit, while statements, condition, and do statements. Um, if you want a little bit of extra credit, you got to do switch statements and case statements. Uh, but if you're gonna um, you must do all the type checking on switch statements, parse uh, case statements in the case. You can't just uh, do those and then think that the parsing is the extra credit. Yeah. How much extra credit? It's down the bottom. Uh, it's like five points. It's more about if you want to do it, not <laughs> the points. <laughs> points, are, points are points, but this is cool stuff. OK. Uh, yeah, recommendation. Uh, finish your incomplete parser before you do anything else, right? This is, and the submission system will tell you how many syntax errors you fail. So you should absolutely know that your parser is 100% correct for uh, while statements, conditions, and do statements, right? So do that first, and you should look at what's, what we give you and how that maps to the grammar so you can think about what you need to do and how you should be writing your parser. Okay, the output. So this is when we get to exactly what, what happens. Um, so what sh should be output? So uh, there'll be only one error per test case. Right? So what does this mean when you're writing your, your program? Find the error and stop. Exactly. Once you find an error, you can stop. Right? You, don't have to, you don't have to do any more parsing. Oh, okay. Which is nice, right? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so there are many different types of errors. We've, we've categorized them here. Um, so these are errors that either involve programmer-defined types and types that are declared more than once. So if you try to uh, have an explicitly declared type, can be, this should be, okay, I may have to change this wording. Uh, the idea is if you declare a type again, <laughs> right, that's an error. Redeclaring it. Yeah, redeclaring it. You can't. So if you have something like c equals twenty, <coughs> c equals twenty. Yeah, at the top you would have uh, type uh, 
if you have a is an int, and then you have a is also an int, the real, oh, right. You, this is an explicit declaration, so you're declaring this twice, so you're redeclaring the type a, even though they're the same. Uh, it's oh, so it's even if it's the same. <coughs> Yeah, that's easier. You don't have to worry so about it. So we must store all the different types somehow, somewhere. To yes, check. absolutely. You need all the types. <laughs> yeah, you need a variable list and a type list. Okay. Uh, an implicit type redeclared explicitly. Right. So how do we uh, ex how do we um, implicitly declare a type? We say A is a type B, right? Mm -hmm. So here we don't know what type B is. It's been implicitly declared. So then if we later try to say, well, B, oh, I guess this does answer the earlier question. This is an error. OK, yeah, so swip, swapping, okay. swapping these two is fine, right? If it's this way, it's fine. But like this, it's breaking this, oops, this type rule. Uh, implicit type redeclared explicitly. Elaborate on that. Uh, yeah, so here type B is implicitly, so this is an implicit, <coughs> right? And here we're trying to explicitly declare type B. So this is a type error. So you can't, you can't retroactively declare. Exactly. clarifies about uses and declarations. Um, okay, declaring a type as a variable, right? Seems like a bad thing. You should probably not do. Right? These are kind of easy things. So if we had uh, if we had type, let's say a is an int, and then in our variable declarations, we say, oh, I want a variable a that's a string. So this is a type name. This is a variable name. Right? So we want to redeclare variables as names. All right, that's pretty straightforward. Um, so yeah, that throws an error. Okay. Yes, and using a type as a variable name, right? That would be that's an error code as well. Right. So if you're in your program, you def you're using a type as a variable name. That's another error. Right. Yeah. Can you explain the difference between the type and the variable again? Sure. <coughs> So, uh, just like, so how do you define new types in C and C++? Type, 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 type F, kind of. Struct. struct, yeah, is more. So type def is actually just a uh, renaming operation, basically. Uh, it does, I mean, it's good for defining essentially new types for the programmer, right? Because when I read it, I can see that, oh, you mean this is integer, or this is centimeters and not just an int, right? So I can no more semantic meaning about that. Um, uh, but yeah, so structs are kind of how you define new types or combinations of types, right? You give them new names. Um, and now I forgot the question. What were we talking about? Type versus yeah. types. Types versus variables. What's the ah, 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 okay, good, good, good. <laughs> okay, it would be like trying to, well, one thing would be like in C, uh, trying to declare so if we have an int, let's say I want to call my int car, right? Error. Yeah, right, this would error because this is a type. Uh, now in C, this is an explicit type, or this is a built-in type, right? Predefined. So yeah, I don't even think this would, oh, no. um, so I don't think this would, yeah, this would be actually be a syntax error. But if we defined, uh, <coughs> So if we find a struct <coughs> foo, right, and we did all that stuff, and then later on we tried to declare an int called foo, I think this would also fail because we have to use a type def to define it from a struct foo to a foo. Uh, but anyways, the point is, right, you don't want to use variables, uh, types as variable names. So that way we know whenever we see a reference what it actually refers to. Does this refer, because otherwise it would be confusing. Does this foo refer to the type foo or the variable foo? Right? 
or if we later on in the program said, I don't know, foo is equal to 10, well, like, what does this even mean, right? Because foo is a type. Okay. Um, then there's errors involving variable declarations. Uh, I should fix this, but that's fine. Uh, variables declare more than once, right? So we can't declare a variable more than once. It makes sense, just like normal programming. Uh, trying to use a variable as a type, also a problem. Okay, um, yeah, so this is where we said, so just like in C, if you try to use a built-in type uh, in the body of the program or in the like int real string, uh, it's gonna cause a syntax error. Okay, so this is what you have to output. So you're outputting error code, right? The constant string error code. And then the code, which is replaced by one of these 2.2, 1.1, whatever the type is, and then the symbol name is the either the type or the variable that's related to that error. And so there's tons of, yeah, so you can see here, like this example. So here I'm defining a type called A, and then later on here, I'm defining a variable called A, right? So I'm redeclaring a type as a variable name, so I output error code 1.3, is that A the built-in type? A? There's, there's only five built-in types. Uh, no, I'm going to forget them all. Int, real, string, boolean, and long. Okay. Okay, if there's a type mismatch, right? So that would be any of those type constraints are violated. Then you need to say that there's a type mismatch you put the line number that this type mismatch occurred on, and you put the constraint, where the constraints are values either C1 through C5, right? one of those five constraints. Uh, and you can assume that violations are only going to happen on a single line. Right? So you're actually using the Lexer is the same API as the Lexer that we gave you in project two. So you can get the line exactly from there like you did in project two. How many total errors are there that we have to check in here? Uh, uh, all 40, of them on this list? 30? I don't, I mean, 40? how do you want to count it? Like these five plus all of these? Yeah, total everything. So I'm going to have to check them all, right? Yeah. Okay, so if there are no semantic errors in your program, <laughs> right, so we're not actually executing the program yet, so. We don't care about that, but we want to show that, okay, because it's if we just say that, like, I don't know, if you just output, like, yay, everything's good, uh, then it's really easy to not actually be correct. Yeah? Awesome. <coughs> I'm assuming we're only worrying about uh, type checking errors. There's not going to be any, like, parsing errors thrown in or lexing uh, the, errors. There will be parsing errors uh, to make sure that you implement those parsing things correctly. Okay. So there are test cases that are checking that you implement those correctly. But yeah, there's no anything else really. I mean, the last thing we're kind of giving you, so right. we're not going to test that. Okay, so if there's no semantic errors, then you're going to output the list of types and variables that are type equivalent, right? So this shows that you actually know how to do this type constraints and to understand the type equivalents. Uh, so you basically, so we have some pseudocode, so this should actually help you kind of decide how to write this and do this output. Um, Basically, oh, where's the example? I think it's further down. Uh, the basic idea is, let's see, these are all type mismatches. I'm not going to go through all these. Ah, yeah. So here we can see a large, large-ish quote, quote program. Um, you know. And then we're going to out. So this program type checks. So this is a good ex example to walk through exactly what's going on here, what are the types are, the fact that there are no type errors. Then when we get here, the output should be, so you're gonna output each of the built-in types. So the built-in types here are boolean, int, long, real, string. And you're gonna output each of the variables and types that are equivalent here. So we have like A, B, C, Y, A1, B1, and foo are all ints in this program. Uh, there are no longs, reals. The string, there's one string, the type B, and the variable test. So these are all strings. And then we have x, 
Nice. OK, so we have the x, right, is an implicit variable here. So x has the same type as <coughs> e and h. So e is the type here, and h is this implicit variable here. You don't need to, so the output is in the order that it appears in the program, which is what you've been doing for the other assignments. So, um, yeah, all of these outputs here are just in the order that they appear. Yeah. So you said you only output if there's no error? Like Correct. Okay. Correct. Yeah, you don't have to do this. As soon as you detect an error, you output that error message and stop. Okay. Uh, any questions on, so obviously I'm expecting you to kind of dig in and figure this out, right? Uh, but I thought it'd be helpful to go over it now. We output the variables in the order that they appear. Variables and types in the order that yeah. they appear, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is about Project Nuri, but was there any like extra credit? Because I got like 105 out of 600, so. Yeah. OK. The total is that I didn't think there was any extra credit. On there was. The total added up to 105 if you oh, looked at the, okay. the site, so yeah. Um, yeah, so that's how it was. So, all right, on this project, so evaluation, so same thing, test cases. We're going to give you some test cases, right? There'll be more test cases on the server. Uh, 25 points for the 1.x error codes, 15 points for the 2.x error codes, right? These are pretty simple kind of checks. Um, the main bulk of the project is type mismatch errors, right? So the type mismatch errors and the no semantic error cases. Uh, so that's where the bulk of the points are. That's where the bulk of the work is, too. Um, and then five points extra credit for doing parsing and type checking for case, case list, and switch statement. Um, so the other very important thing. So you'll notice that on here, there's no points for implementing the parser, right? Because that's kind of what you have to do. Uh, so there's, you know, you have to implement the par your parts of the parser correctly. There's only three parts, right? And this shows that you know how to implement a parser based on a grammar, right? And especially because we're giving you all the rest of the parser. So it's actually, you should look at that to help guide you of what you should do for your part. So um, there's a big penalty for not doing that, so do it. <laughs> I don't know how else to incentivize that. Uh, because really, you can't really get the other ones correct if you're not parsing it correctly, right? Because you're gonna fail those test cases. So you need to do it correctly, so I, Highly recommend do the parser first, submit it, see that you pass all the test cases, that way everything's great, um, and then that should be good. Uh, just like before, I don't think this is a surprise to anyone, all your outputs gotta match exactly, right? Doesn't match exactly, it's <coughs> wrong. Uh, submitting the project here. Any questions? Uh, it will tell you based on the category. It's not going to tell you. It will just tell you how much you pass. Yeah. I mean, it's not going to tell you exactly which things you're failing or not failing. What did you mean by lexing errors? By lexing errors? Did I say lexing errors? You said no testing lexing errors. Yeah. So, um, because we give you the lexer. So, we're not going to throw, like, weird characters at you. Right? Because we wrote the lexer. Excited? <laughs> yeah. Uh, there'll also be, so we have what, midterm, was it next Friday? Yeah. Don't. <laughs> Maybe he forgot. Oh. Don't. <laughs> uh, so there'll be a homework. I'll sign it later today, so that way you'll have some practice. And then I think by the end of the week, I'll submit or I'll send out a uh, practice midterm so that we can go over it next Wednesday. So we'll all be very prepared. <laughs> through all this the semantic stuff so that we can actually get to uh, more type checking stuff. That's what you're doing for the project, right? So uh, we want to get through all this so that we can get to type checking so that we can. Uh, but I think, I mean, it's pretty, I don't know. Maybe you can tell me if it was or was not. But I think uh, it should be fairly clear the project, right? I don't think it's too outlandish or crazy. Um, uh, but. 
hopefully as you get into it, you'll see when we do type checking and automated type checking, we'll see how those match up. Yeah. For the test cases that will be online, should we be expecting to see at least one of every one of every type of error? It's hmm. a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> yeah, it would be nice to help us out. So I we're mean, not guessing. Well, there's a whole document that's like a I think you print out as a PDF, it's like fifteen pages with a bunch of examples, so there's also a lot of examples on there too. Okay. <coughs> So we've talked about semantics, we've talked about pointers. If you sacrifice this class to finish project three, I highly recommend you go through and review all of the pointer semantics that we went through, because that stuff's definitely gonna be on midterms, and it's really cool stuff that you have to know so that that way you understand how pointers work, right? I mean, I think that's kind of a fundamental uh, computer science concept, and so I don't want you to leave this class without knowing how pointers work. All right, okay, so we talked about with, a little bit with pointers, we talked about malloc, right? So malloc creates some new thing in memory for us and returns the address of that new box in memory. And so now we're gonna look at a little bit more specifically about memory allocation, what it means semantically, and what are some of the errors that can occur here. Uh, so basically, memory allocation is all about, if we think about circle box diagrams, right? How do we create new locations, right? What is the location in the circle box diagram? It's literally a two, the box. the box, yes, the box. So memory allocation creates new boxes and reserves that address that's associated with them. And so what malloc will do, right, kind of heap allocation malloc is going to try to find memory that's not currently reserved and return that memory. And so it's either going to automate, so we'll get into this, but it's, uh, memory allocation is going to either try to associate memory with a variable, right, where it's going to actually bind that name to some memory location, or it's going to not give it a name and return that address, right, which is what we saw in the alloc, uh, malloc. Uh, so what is deallocation? The removal? Clearing, clearing the, basically saying that this is not, this, this bit of memory is not reserved and then nothing else. Yeah, so, exactly, right? So we're releasing that location and saying that this address can be reused by somebody else later, right? So we're saying that, okay, we're gonna release this location back in the world and so now this program can use it again at some later point. So how can memory be allocated? So what are all the ways that you allocate memory in your C, C++ program? Using the new. Using new, but where does that actually, where does that go? Where does it come from? It's dynamic. It's dynamic? So what type, what, like, uh, so where does that actually live? On the heap? Yeah, so you can allocate memory on the heap. Uh, what else? Is that it? Stack. stack. So how do you allocate memory on the stack? Just, just declaring it. Yeah. Just declaring, it. declaring it where? Is it anywhere you declare it going to be on the stack? Uh, within the program. Locally. Local variables. Yeah, local variables and function parameters are going to be on the stack. Right? So we have the heap, the stack. Is that it? And then you have your global. Global variables. Right? So yeah, we have global variables and actually constants. Uh, I guess I guess it more depends on the compiler of exactly where those are stored. But uh, so in general, right? How many times is global allocation done? Once. Once. Right? It's global. The program. The program allocates memory or allocates locations and gives those locations address for each of the global variables. Right? And when is it deallocated? Well. When the program terminates. Yeah, never almost, right? If from the program's perspective, it's never deallocated. Right? After the program terminates, does the program care what memory is allocated or deallocated? No. No, right? It doesn't really matter. Okay, so stack allocation. So when are variables, locations allocated on the stack? When they declare. When a function starts. Yeah, when a function starts, right? When they're declared is more of how they appear in the source code, right? But it's really at each function invocation that that memory gets created on the stack. We're actually going to look at how that actually happens because I think it's really cool. 
Um, so when is that memory free? When exiting out of the scope of the... What was it? When exiting that code block. Yeah, when you exit that function invocation, <coughs> right? That's when that memory is deallocated. So do you have to do anything as a programmer to automatically deallocate variables? No. no. On the stack? No, right? You don't have to do anything. It happens automatically. So how is out of scope defined? You're trying to access that, that variable or that particular piece of code or, or data, excuse me. When you're something that's that not scope. declared in the... When it's already been deallocated. Yeah, but what is out of scope? How do we know what's out of scope or in scope? Who defines the block, why the block structure? It's not on the stack. <laughs> it's part of the semantics of the language, which is what we've been studying, right? So the scoping rules, right, are all done, that's part of the semantics of the language, right? So you can see the scoping rules are actually influencing when stack memory can be deallocated, right? That's why it can be automatically deallocated, because in C we know, okay, I can only ever reference this variable inside this block. So after I leave this block, I can automatically deallocate that variable, right? Nobody else could ever reference that variable name. So what about heap, heap allocation? So is it done automatically? No. No, right? So who does heap allocation? We do. We do. We do. Uh, yeah, so we as programmers, right? The programmer explicitly <coughs> Does the allocation, and then how is, is are things deallocated automatically on the heap? No. No, right? We have to explicitly deallocate memory. Okay, this is good. Um, keep thinking about this. We'll start on project four. All right, thanks. See you all on Wednesday.